All right, so it is 10 a.m. and we want to be respectful of your time. Um, we are recording today's session, which we will edit um, out the beginnings and the end if we go long, but we'll make sure that you get a copy of this recording so you don't have to take copious notes. She froze for me, is everyone still? Unfrozen. Uh, that might have been my intro. Oh, here we go. <laughs> then, You're freezing up, Lindsay. For me, at least. I don't know. Oh, sorry. Okay, it's okay. Um, well, we also just ask that your microphones are off and um, your uh, cameras are off as well, so that we can be mindful for. Um, I know I'm sharing internet with four kids right now, so it's going to freeze a couple of times. I, I apologize. Um, luckily, David's doing the, the bulk of the work for us today, so um, you won't have to look at me very much longer, but we appreciate you being here. Um, I'd love to introduce you to David Chan. He is going to talk all things Google, um, but we also want you to kind of drive the session as well. So any questions you have, please drop them in the chat and I'll make sure to um, interject um, as necessary. And then we are all aware that the smartest person in the room is the room. So if you have an answer, go ahead and drop that in the chat as well, um, because we're better together. So um, at the end of today, you'll get your PDH. I will share that link in the chat as well. But other than that, I'd like to hand it over to David Chan. Sweet. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so <laughs> I just got off a call with our, our team, and we actually joked around about the freezing thing. We actually thought it'd be a pretty cool, uh, maybe a, a Google Meet prank to just all freeze and like pretend like we're actually frozen, right? But we're actually still uh, live and, and you can kind of uh, hear what other people are gonna say about you while you while they think you're frozen. So you can try that today. I know it's April Fool's Day. I know April Fool's Day is pretty much canceled across the world, I get that. Um, but maybe file that away for a future uh, gig or whatever. I'm not even a prankster, but whatever. Um, yeah, statue me, right. What did they call those back in the day where you recorded that and like everyone's frozen and you did a YouTube video with that? What was that called again? I always forget. Um, we, so, and we just need a new song for that, right? To, to make it go viral. So you heard it here first, um, let's do it. All right, so I'm gonna present my screen. And like Lindsay said, I'm totally, this is like, um, I want it to be q and A. I I want it to be a lot of answers. Um, uh, questions and answers and conversation. So I don't have like a specific, I, yes, I have a deck, but it's very open-ended. So, um, and I will add to it. So uh, I'm just gonna keep it like this screen, I think for, for now, you, you should be able to see my screen and uh, it's Google office hours. I did pull in the whole Charlie Brown, right? Doctors in, we saw that idea con, love that. And uh, although I'm not a doctor, just play one on the internet. Um, so welcome again, this is the bit.ly. I'll have that on each page. And as Lindsay said, I am, uh, well, she didn't say yet. So I am the Director of Instructional Technology at Evanston Township High School. I'm a Google Certified Innovator and Trainer. And uh, you can find me on Twitter at Chanatown. I'm also the IdeaCon Conference Coordinator. So um, love loved that we were able to, to connect at, earlier in, in February. Uh, we're very blessed and fortunate to have that happen and uh, looking forward to seeing uh, folks at next year's event, I guess, right? Uh, today is April Fool's Day, and although Google is not showing, uh, or they decided to put the resources towards more pressing uh, needs, there is uh, a great collection of April Fool's Day jokes, as you know, from a variety of companies, Google included. This is one of my favorites. Um, let's see. I know we won't be able to get the sound for this, but this is a good opportunity to also demonstrate perhaps closed captioning, right? So when you play a YouTube video and uh, you have the option to also show captions, and this is also available, let me turn my sound down so it doesn't blow my, there we go. So you see that the the uh, captions coming up on both YouTube videos now, also in Hangouts Meet. So you can turn on captions for even this recording or this presentation right now, as well as in slides when you're doing presentations. The options to throw up automatic captioning is available for uh, all those applications. So uh, this is one of my favorites though, Gmail Blue, uh, the video there. And so if you get a chance, take a look at some um, uh, April Fool's Day jokes from Google or other companies as well. Uh, and then the other thing I just wanted to show to kind of kick us off is a, an excellent resource that Google's put together in um, a pretty quick uh, time frame. It is called Teach From Home. So this is again linked from the slide deck. This slide deck is available at bit.ly 
slash idea google 4120 for today's date. I see many of you anonymous nyan cats and tigers and wombats coming in. So that's great. When you click on the, the image here, it'll take you to the website, uh, Teach From Home. And so um, this is a great hub of resources that Google's worked with uh, in collaboration with a couple of other organizations. The first thing you could do is a step-by-step -step guide for a toolkit. So this is a downloadable PDF in numerous languages here. And this takes you to a PDF document. It's pretty much just like a slide deck that has been set up and it has links to all these sorts of resources, including, I, I really like the workflow of this document. So it's like setting up your space. You know, what, you know, what does my space right now in my dining room look like? How do I uh, make sure I'm in the right place for, for Wi-Fi? Uh, how do I start creating? How do we start thinking about engaging my students online? And then preparing for that uh, step, right? Um, how do I go ahead and think about, you know, my digital classroom environment? Am I gonna do presentations? How am I gonna assess? Um, so how do I start thinking about that? Doing the actual teaching, you know, so much of it is done, whether it's recording live sessions or doing a live call. Um, how do I check for understanding as my students are attending these sessions, whether it's live synchronous or uh, virtual asynchronously, um, you know, thinking about that. How do I get students to collaborate? You know, even though we're all in different places, how do we get people to work together uh, digitally? And then uh, talking a little bit about accessibility. How do I make sure I'm reaching as many students as possible? And then um, supporting them all throughout the way. And we know, you know, one thing that's not really on here is just well-being for students, making sure that we are checking in with students. And, and above all, you know, all the work aside, how are our students navigating and handling this time, especially as it grows longer and longer? You know, are we, you know, just a quick pause for, uh, a reflection, just my own kids and, and emails I've been getting from, from students is, you know, we want to make sure we're connecting with our students. And we want to make sure that our students all have kind of like that, that connection with adults. And I even encourage like our library staff and our uh, support staff, they may not have students of their own per se in classes, but if there's the regulars that come to the library, there are the people who come visit your computer lab or, um, you know, you see them in the hallways even, reaching out to them and checking in them is, is such a, an important piece, I think, right now. And I hear it from students, especially then that first week, they're like, or from families that were saying like, oh, I haven't heard fr from any of my teachers yet, or my students, you know, feeling a little lonely because they haven't been able to connect with others. Um, you know, the more we spend indoors and away from each other and other people's homes, uh, not being able to go to a friend's house, teachers and staff, we can create those opportunities for engagement, uh, even if it doesn't have like a huge lesson attached to it. So um, be mindful of that. All right, back to the toolbox here. Again, each of those kind of headings goes deeper into uh, some of the things you can work on. And again, lots of resources, lots of links, and lots of quick to do's, you know, like it's not a whole page of, you know, these are the 12 steps to, um, you know, start a Google Meet call. It's just three steps, right? Go to Meet, copy the URL, go to classroom, create a material, paste, and then go. And then there's more info so you can get deeper, but uh, I like these setups because they have, they're have they pretty quick and easy to get up and running. So that's your toolkit, excuse me here. Um, let me clean up some tabs. And then as I scroll down, you got a nice video from Dean here from Google from it. I haven't, I haven't watched that yet, but I'm sure it's great. And then how do we kind of, they have a couple of different clusters on this website. How do I teach remotely with video calls, right? So this is a huge one we'll come back to in a little bit. But basically, how do I do these live sessions? What does that look like, right? So again, everything from setting up your home for, for video calling, what does that look like? How do we make the adjustments needed to actually doing a Hangouts Meet, which we're all on right now as viewers, but how do we actually do it from the host point? How did Lindsay set this call up and how would we invite uh, students? What are the best practices for getting students on a call? And we're starting to hear, and, and no surprise, right? Some, some interesting or questionable behaviors that are happening during online uh, video calls, whether you're using Hangouts Meet or Zoom. We know that Google has responded um, by making some key adjustments on Meet, Meet but there, there are still other things, and we all know it, students will find it, that uh, they're gonna be able to do. And we as teachers have to be mindful of that, uh, take the opportunities to educate about citizenship and behavior issues and remind them that online is pretty much the same thing as in face-to-face, -face. like there are, you know, behavior expectations, and uh, we need to make sure, and this is now a, a, a time greater than ever to work with them on that. Uh, then you have, you know, the ability to do live Q&As and the ability to live stream uh, as an option instead of holding like these live calls. So the difference there is instead of having this call where 25, or I, I last checked, uh, you know, 25 of you are all on and, and participating, that's a huge suck on bandwidth. What if we 
just did, I'm just, or Lindsay and I are just taking this lesson and we're streaming it out. You're just watching it on YouTube as opposed to being able to participate, right? That'll be an easier kind of way for you to engage and just watch in terms of bandwidth and, and less complications, less technical difficulties potentially. All right, then, hey, we don't need video calls. We know the expectation for teachers, we all have uh, lives on our own and, and we know we may not be able to, to navigate and juggle uh, our kids, uh, caring for our elderly, uh, doing housework, whatever we need to do while we're teaching. So how do I keep students engaged without video calls, right? So here's a whole set of resources. Again, we can dig into some of these, but just taking a quick look, whether you use Google Classroom, a website, uh, a quiz or, or forms, or just feedback in a document, you know, having that uh, interaction with students are, are some great ways to, to uh, navigate that all without video, right? All without having a live session. Uh, accessibility options, we talked a little bit about closed captions already. Um, be able to use voice typing is a, is a great kind of underutilized feature in my opinion. There's a ton of accessibilities on, on a Chromebook um, that are available as well as other uh, abilities and features in the G Suite. Engagement. Okay, so you know, now that I don't have my students right in front of me, how do I make sure they're actually engaged in MOVA? And, and I will say, just anecdotally, I think, again, I think our students are craving this engagement. So I think this is a good time, and I think there's an opportunity to really you know, tap into that and, and, and think you know, our students are, again, in their homes, they're kind of locked up, they wanna interact with each other, they wanna to, to chat. I think we, we, we are at a time where we can see some very vibrant discussions. We can see you know, students willing to meet with us one-on-one, -on -one, right? Instead of pulling teeth like, hey, can you come in after school and let's talk? I think students might be jumping at the bit to kind of, you know, have a, have a quick 10 minute call with their, with their teacher. Um, being able to, to play around on the Jamboard, that's a digital whiteboard space where you can just go ahead and, and collaborate on a, a, in an open format. And again, including, of course, parents and guardians in on, on everything that's happening. So using guardian notifications as part of Google Classroom to keep them up to date with what's going on. So that's engagement wise. And then uh, keeping in touch with other teachers, you know, again, lots of using the resources again to, to kind of collaborate and uh, work with staff in your, in your area. So that's the Teach From Home Hub. I just wanted to point that out, give that as a resource. Um, there's a link, I think, at the bottom of that to also YouTube learning. I won't go deep into that, but just, uh, you know, that's a whole bunch of content. So, you know, we are, we're, we're might likely very familiar with things like Khan Academy, but this is, you know, additional resources besides that. I did see like Sal, Sal Khan doing like daily uh, homeschooling with, with Khan Academy, something like that. So there's a bunch of resources on here. Um, as they say, it's not meant to replace homework assignment by teachers. It's more meant to complement that work. And I will also say, you know, we're getting bombarded with a whole bunch of resources, right? everything from every single ed tech company that's willing to, of course, be altruistic and share, but also we got to keep in mind what's in it for them, right? They're trying to generate business and, and get us to, to purchase their product when the freebies end. So I just want to be mindful of that, that we can easily suffer from. I personally, maybe uh, from resource overload, right? I, I, emails daily about like, these are a whole bunch of lists of resources. This is all the things that are free and, and are great for students. I personally, again, recommend sticking to uh, the tried and true. So what you are most familiar with uh, or picking one or two to kind of get familiar with and, and dig in on and become an expert, something that your, your school has and, and access to already, uh, or it's something that you really think will be useful for your instruction right now. Uh, I would you know, file away some of those other emails or those lists, keep one list maybe handy or keep this Teach From Hub uh, handy so that you can reference it later. But um, it's easy to suffer from resource overload from the teacher perspective. And then on top of that, you know, for the students, if we all, if, if think about it if for high school, I teach at a high school, you know, if, if my students have uh, seven teachers and they're all giving like these great projects, you know, and totally tons of uh, awesome ideas and, and great learning opportunities, but it just becomes so overwhelming. Uh, so we have to be mindful of that. And I know that ISB put out some guidelines about, you know, the content, how much time, you know, we're recommending, I think about 20 minutes per day. Uh, or a minimum of that or a max, I forget the minimum max, but it's something where it's, it's, you know, taking a step back and really thinking about meaningful work and engaging work, but also knowing where your students are at and knowing where your school is at in terms of what's meaning, what's, I guess, attainable uh, and, and mindful during this time. So I just want to, to talk about resources a little bit. All right, so let me pause there. Uh, I have, you know, again, a couple more slides for, for taking a deep dive, I think in like maybe classroom or meet. But let's look at some questions and let's get some discussion going about um, 
you know, what's what you're here for, because I, I don't want to make it just about me. So that was my 15 minutes. I'll pause. And I don't know, chat, uh, Lindsay, you want to, I don't know if yep. there's something that came up in chat, go ahead. Yes, there were um, two questions. Um, when using Google Forms, Google Chromebook book lockdown for browsers. Mm -hmm. um, what about when using PCs? Is there a way to lock down browsers if they are not using a Google Chromebook that is free? Good question. So what the question is referring to is lockdown mode on Chromebooks. So there's your answer right there. Um, that that a Google Forms quiz can be, and let me see if I can pop open a quiz here. Um, okay. So <laughs> you don't need to see the Renaissance map. All right. So when I open up a quiz, uh, make a new quiz, so I'm in my Idea Illinois account, so I won't have too many quizzes here in this one per se. But when I go to this and then when I go to make this form a quiz, there is this option if we at IDEA had Chromebooks to turn on, oh, I'm not sharing, am I still sharing my screen? I'm not anymore, sorry, here we go, let's do this again. Apologies, there we go, you see my screen again. So here I am in a quiz, let's do that again. I open up a, a form, okay, and I go to uh, quizzes, settings, and then quizzes. And this is the locked mode on Chromebooks. So if your school uses Chromebooks, then you may, and they're managed, right? They have to be managed by the school. This is the option that you would be able to check uh, so that it would go in locked mode. Now this will work if even despite your, your you know, this Chromebooks are not in the building. It's more based on they're using a school Chromebook and when they take this quiz, so when they go to this quiz, it'll say you're about to enter a locked quiz. And what that means for those that are unfamiliar with it is that this restricts access to only this tab, essentially, only this quiz. And then when they're done with the quiz, they would get out of that lock mode and they have to reboot, I forget. Um, and so that will work, again, to answer the question, only on Chromebooks, but it will work outside of the building. Now, in that respect, I don't know, do I recommend doing that? I, I guess you could because the, the student will know that they're going into this lock mode. What I, I, the reason I hesitate is we also use a product called Go Guardian, and you may have a product where you know teachers are able to like monitor their students when they're in the classroom. I actually don't have that turned on for our teachers when our students are outside the building. So I don't want them to be able to monitor screens, even if it's during the school day or whatnot, because now it's we're all at different places in time. So with locked Chromebooks though, on, on the quizzes, I think that's okay to still use because um, the student knows when they're going into that mode and you can um, uh, 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 open that up. Now, one more thing on that is that it's not, we, we all know, we have to start rethinking how we do assessments, right? We know that, um, you know, the student could very well have a computer right here, which I do, right? I have a, a totally different laptop that I can just look up answers on and locked quiz mode will not do anything for that, right? So we really, you know, nothing is going to be foolproof in this kind of setup. It's why AP, you know, exams are, are going online, but they say right up front that their questions are not going to be, or at least harder to be uh, searchable and Googleable, you know, things like that. Um, there's something you want to think about, maybe like having a time limit or, you know, there are ways to kind of make it a little bit more uh, uh, assessment oriented and, and, you know, mimicking the in-classroom experience. But at the end of the day, uh, we really don't know. So it, it's a good opportunity to rethink how we assess and whether it's not using just a standard multiple choice quiz anymore, doing more project-based learning, doing more open-ended questions. Those are some things I think uh, teachers are, are thinking about more in this kind of environment. All right, Lindsay. Okay, yep. cool. Next question is, when using Google Classroom, how do I see and know when something is turned on or turned in? Oh, sure. Uh, let's go back into... Um, my screen again. I should just keep sharing this. Sorry. Um, let me see if I can jump out to. I teach online and I uh, with National Lewis, and we have a, a Google certification class. So I can go ahead and show you some old probably data. I won't show you the current class. Um, and let's see. Okay. So when things are turned in, so this is uh, ignore the names. Sorry. Um, well, maybe I shouldn't do that. Let me create a new class. Sorry, I don't want to break any rules here. Let's do a new class. Do, 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 do. Okay, test class. So let's take a deep dive on, on Classroom really quick too while we're here. So with Classroom, of course, you can create assignments and 
uh, one of the coolest features about when you create assignment is creating uh, a, an assignment based off of Google Doc that each student is going to have their own copy of. I call it the digital uh, copy machine, right? So if I go ahead and create an assignment, and uh, chapter one, okay? I can go ahead and add something from my Google Drive. All right, so let's say I want to add um, something like notes. Share notes, okay? And then here's the option. When you add a Google Doc, you have the option to uh, have the doc be just viewable by everyone. So maybe that's just a, an agenda document that you want everyone to, to have eyes on, but they, don't, they can't edit it. You can also have everyone edit the file. So that's maybe like a shared notes doc. Like, hey, everyone, go ahead. You can, let's collaborate on this review document or notes. And then, uh, or you can have make it copy for each student. And what that will do is, again, digital copy machine, name the, the um, document with the student's name and uh, have them uh, uh, as an assignment with that. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. A couple of other things while I'm here, some things you may or may not know about uh, Google Classroom and assignments. You can, of course, schedule this to go out later. So you can create uh, assignments way in advance and schedule these out in advance. You can also save this as draft. You can designate specific students. So right now, I don't have any students in this test class. But if I did, I could choose which students I want to share this assignment to. So maybe I want to revise this so that everyone can edit this, but I'll only assign it to four of my students. And then another four will get a different assignment. So we can start talking about how you can differentiate learning uh, using Google Classroom like this, right? Have multiple assignments for specific sets of groups of students. So I can do that. Um, I can sign point value, I have due date. These are self-explanatory. Topics are like how you organize it. So like categories and, and things like that. And then rubrics, uh, this is a newer feature on Google Classroom. You can establish rubrics. You can also reuse rubrics from uh, other Google, Google Classroom assignments and you can import a rubric from Sheets. And then lastly, originality reports, this is newer as well. This is kind of like your turnitin.com or your plagiarism checker. So you have, I believe, up to three uh, checks right now for the free G Suite version. So what this will do is it'll basically do a Google search on the document and see if it uh, is detecting any plagiarism copy from the web. They are also making it in the future. I don't think it's quite ready for prime time yet, but the ability to check across each other within your domain, right? So two students from your same school turned in the same assignment, be able to check on that. I don't know if that's properly running just yet, but it will be. All right, so when I assign that uh, document or assignment, then I will see, uh, and again, I don't have any students in here, so we'll have to pretend a little bit, but when I go into that assignment, we will see how many people have turned in versus how many people have not, right? So if I had 20 students I assigned it to, this will go up to 20, and then as the days go on or the hours go on, people turn it in, this actually changes live from 20 to 10, and 10 people turned in. Five, uh, you know, uh, five still left, 15 turned in. And what I can do is you can see these change highlights. I can click on it and quickly see who's turned it in, who hasn't. Um, and then I can email any folks that haven't turned it in yet so I can be in touch with them. I can look at just the ones. I can even jump in live to like that document to see had they started it yet. Can I go ahead and add some comments into that doc and work with that student a little further? So I think that answers a long answer question, but I want to kind of show a couple of things. Again, being able to see who turned it in and then clicking on it and then uh, being able to interact with those students who haven't turned it in yet. Thank you, David. I think Google Classroom is, is such a great option for remote learning right now because it is so user friendly um, and you don't have to teach Google Classroom to your students. You know, you could just use it in, in a simple, easy workflow type of way. Um, another another okay. question here. Um, can I delete comments on the stream after a set amount of time, even if they have attached a picture to turn it in for an activity? I believe so. So I'm in the stream. So a couple of things on the stream. So this is your stream on Classroom, right? So if I, uh, you know, have this test uh, post, okay, I have this there. You as the teacher have total control on the stream. So you will always have the following. And this goes for uh, people who post your stream. You'll be able to, to remove items from your stream. Um, one thing uh, you might know, want to know, though, about stream is do we even want our students posting to the stream? So when I go to the settings in the upper right, Okay, so the answer to your question is yes, including uh, a photo and not, not, whatnot. Uh, but when I go into the class settings, if I scroll down a little bit to the stream, here's the default. The default is on, right? Students can post and comment, but you can change it to only comment. So like you make a post and students can just comment to that post. They can't create new posts in there. 
And then lastly, you could just make it only teachers can post or comment. So really its purpose is just a push out announcements, right? Teachers push out to students. There's no, in, uh, there's no interaction uh, necessary here. And honestly, I think that's how I would use the stream to be, to be quite honest. I mean, again, if you're maybe for the, I, I, I you know, I have a, a third grader who's using Google Classroom. So they, I think they have it so that students can post and comment and they, and they get a kick out of it, right? They, they respond to each other and whatnot. But, but if you're concerned about inappropriate, you know your students, if you're concerned about some behaviors there, uh, or if you want to, you know, or if you had an incident already, you can go ahead and change that right here. Now, this doesn't mean that there's no interaction whatsoever, right? So I can do this though. And then if I want discussion, I probably would go more to classroom, classwork and then create a question. So when I create a question here, that is going to be like, hey, how, how is everyone doing? Okay. And when I post a question, this is actually an assignment. So think of this like your discussion uh, question uh, assignment. And what I can do here is I can do all the same things. Here's my instructions. Here's my uh, ability to add stuff. I can, hey, say, watch this video. Tell me what you think. Or here's a website. Go visit it. You know, what are your thoughts on this article from, from the news uh, website? Here's an attachment of the assignment. Um, please reflect on it, yada, yada, right? All that stuff. Um, and then you have the option to do a quick poll. So if you want to poll your students, that'd be multiple choice here. But if it's more discussion-based, short answer. And then down in the lower right here, these two um, check marks or check boxes are, are important, these options. One is, do we want students to edit their answer? So maybe not, right? So the default is no. When I post something to a discussion bar, I don't want to give them the ability to change it. Maybe, you know, I don't want them to read others and be influenced about it. I want your first opinion and, and get that out there. I don't want you to be able to say something bad and then change it really quickly later. So I can lock that in right here. They can't edit their answers. And then do I want them to reply to one another? So if I uncheck that, they can just, this is just a, an answer that goes to me, the teacher. Um, they will not actually see each other. I don't think, I, I, I have to double check that one. I don't think they can see each other's, um, but they certainly will not be able to reply to each other, okay? They may be able to see each other, we have to double check. But if you do want them to reply to one another, and that's the default, um, you will leave that checked. And here's another thing I like about that, this feature is that they actually don't see each other's answers until they make a post. So again, I, I've taught online for a while and, and one of the, and I've taken online classes, right? And I'll be honest, if I could see everyone's answers before I answer myself, I get influenced by that. So it's nice that I, this option is here so that I have to compose my response first and then I get to see others and again, potentially reply to one another. So this is a quick shout out to, to questions and ways to generate discussion without using your stream. Okay, great. So next question uh, was about some sort of uh, bulletin board within Google Classroom. And they did just add this kind of like materials um, feature to it where I think that you can do what this this person is asking about. Oh, sure. So again, uh, a stream is a great place for your bulletin board, right? So this is, you know, uh, just a running stream though, right? So it's not, it's not as good for like, if you want just something static, but if you want just announcements, you want to say, hey, I found this great uh, video, please check it out right here. That's, that's your announcement board, you know, current events. It, it's blog style. So the most current one is at the top, as you can see here. Um, and again, as you can see, we can still add things uh, just like we can in other assignments. But uh, as Lindsay is mentioning too, in class work, there is an option to add materials. Okay, so I can just say, here's uh, a great website. Again, teach at home. Okay, let's get that uh, link, teach at home, Google. Okay. So I grab this link, go ahead and add it here. Boom, great resource. Oh, too many buttons pressing, all right. Okay, got it. Don't need notifications. How do I get rid of that? Okay. Um, oop. And then I'll go ahead and do that. I can say, um, so this is where I can add it. To, oh, so quick shout out here. If you teach more than one prep or class, if you have multiple Google Classrooms, you can post things in multiple classrooms, right? Um, so you don't have to like, uh, go into each class and, and post or copy paste and, and repost things like that. So be mindful of that saves you a ton of time. Uh, I don't think you can schedule things in multiple classes yet. That's a big feature ask. Um, so uh, you can post it live, which, you know, it would just go live right now. You can't schedule it in advance. You also can't. Yeah. So keep that in mind. Uh, this is also where you, uh, topics might come in handy. So you mentioned bulletin board. So I may call this even bulletin board um, so that everything I post 
in this topic will stay clustered together in a topic or a group of resources called bulletin board. So let's do another one. Okay, material. And then let's do my YouTube one. Okay, where's the site? And go back here, YouTube resources. And again, add link. I could have added a video, I could do file, things like that. Choose my topic, bulletin board, post it. And again, it's gonna be grouped uh, in here. And then with here, you, all your topics will be, uh, will be displayed here, so your categories, and then you can drag and drop these guys. Um, let's drag this one down so that my bulletin board is at the top. Okay, so my bulletin board's at the top. I don't want that actually in the bulletin board, but this is gonna where my trackpad skills will kind of come into play. So be mindful of that. I mean, I, I can fix that, but I'm live, so getting a little nervous. No, all right, so that's good. So that's bulletin board materials. And again, using that to share out. Uh, all right, that's gonna drive me crazy now. Right, move up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, next question while I fix this. <laughs> okay. Um, there there are a couple other questions for different tools, but I'm going to continue with Google Classroom questions since we're here right now. Um, there's a question about any kind of good instruction guides to share with students, whether it's videos, infographics, um, with uh, regards to turning in assignments on various devices. So if you're using you know, something like Google Classroom on a PC versus Apple, do you know of any instruction guides that exist that could be shared with students to help kind of take away some of those obstacles? Yeah, so this is gonna, I, don't, I hope this doesn't come across snarky, but I, I, I do say Google does have a pretty good job of when they have their support articles. Um, they say like, try this from, are you on a uh, computer? Are you on a Mac? Are you on an Android? Stuff like that. So let's see I don't know if I can find one really quick, but when you do, uh, when you go look up support articles, they generally do say like, this is how you do it um, from the various devices. So let me see, Guardian Summaries. I, I wanna try, I'm trying to think of one that I saw recently and so I can show you an example of that. Um, okay, while I'm here though, since I found this, a lot of people usually ask what uh, Guardian Summaries look like and what they use. So again, with Guardian Summaries, when you invite students to your class, you have the option to invite Guardians using an email address. And then uh, once the Guardians sign up for even just one class in your school or domain, they are then signed up for all the classes in there. And the Guardians always have the option to opt out and turn them on and off. They also have the option to, to adjust the frequency, meaning if I get it daily or weekly. And then what a Guardian summary looks like is, is pretty much right here where they see any uh, missing work, any work coming up, and then activity from the last week. They don't they see things like grades. They don't actually see the assignment. They can't click in and, and be a part of your classroom. So it's more of just a info push out rather than a, a more active part in that. So I'm gonna be mindful of Guardian summaries. And then here, so here's an example. When I set up Guardian email summaries, you see how it says computer, which again, they're assuming computer, PC or Mac because it's web-based, it's gonna have a similar experience. But if you're on an iPhone or if you're on an Android, then here are some instructions specific for that. Hmm, that's good to know. I didn't I even that realize that existed. Answer, so maybe partly the question. Yeah. I, I think so. Mm -hmm. All right. So then moving kind of out of the Google Classroom question, the uh, next one was, um, oh, I just lost it. Hold on. I had something to do. Okay. Is it true that you cannot finish a meeting in Google Meet and students can use that link to go back and meet together on their own? I want to say, okay, so I know they made some changes in this. I don't think that was one of them that they changed. Um, let me just, so let's talk about Meet for a second, right? So we're on a, on a Google Meet uh, call. And if you look at your um, people, if you click on people, you see everyone that's on the call. Um, so right now I can't unmute people. Um, and, and I don't know, see, I didn't think I was going to be able to actually remove people as well. Um, Lindsay, I don't know if that's because I'm presenting right now or, uh, if someone else, don't do it, but can you click on someone else that's not you and see if you can remove remove that person? Yeah, so I, I knew- Lindsay, I, 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 Lindsay, go ahead. I can, I can uh, Lindsay mute can, and, okay, oh, you can? Yeah, I can uh, okay. mute and remove people, but um, I think, David, because you're in the idea. domain that okay. I use right. to create this, okay. you might have other 
features that others don't. Okay. Because they really, they really tried to, that was a big thing early on, right? That, that students could remove each other, including the teacher. Um, so they changed that pretty quickly on the fly. And I can't imagine what the engineers were thinking. Uh, they're like, oh my gosh, we have to do this like right now. Um, so they, they did make that change. There are still some, some gaps though. I, I believe people can still mute others. I, I was just testing at the beginning, you know, on a different account. So you have to be mindful of some of the things that the students might be able to do still. And again, that's something that you want to, again, have that knowledge in advance and then um, maybe have those conversations with. Uh... There you go. And it tells you who did it, Edwin, I see you. Um, so see, so that that is true right now. So students could are, are going to probably mess around with that. We got to be mindful of that and, and just, you know, set the expectations for what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. Um, and then honestly, you know, this is uh, something we're gonna have to, to deal with and potentially, you know, have conversations with the student that becomes out of hand and maybe don't get invited back for, for a little bit or you have a one-on-one -on -one with them. Um, you know, all the same behavior expectations that you deal with uh, on a regular day-to-day -day school basis, um, you know, gotta keep those in mind. But the answer to the question, I believe, I believe only the host can, I think they made the change. I don't know I'm thinking about it. Only the host can uh, officially start the meeting. So then when the meeting's over, the students would not be able to go back in. I think we do need to check that. I can pull up the the, the uh, email that um, I saw about or the article and I'll post it in my slide deck, but I believe they've made that change. I have not personally tested it. I will be completely honest and transparent. We have we have been using Zoom at our school. Um, there, there are some, uh, we decided to use that. There was you know, a couple more features in, in Zoom that we used uh, instead of Google Meet, but I know schools are using both or others as well all throughout, so. Same with us. Um, we like the closed captioning feature in Google Meet. Mm -hmm. So you're able to turn that on um, and kind of not only hear, but see what people are saying. So that's one of the benefits that we've seen with Google Meet. Um, another question that popped up was, how do you um, create a waiting room for people yeah. to enter before coming into the Google Meet? So as far as I know, that's not available, right? I mean, that's a huge uh, piece of, of Zoom and they've even pushed that out as like the, the requirement um, and uh, for, for virtual waiting rooms. So I don't, um, that's something you just have to be mindful of in terms of, we could probably be creative, I guess, like maybe not giving out the, the meeting room link to, to people until they do some kind of check-in or something like that. Like we can rethink about how to potentially set something like that up. But I think it's going to be, you know, one of the reasons I loved Meet was because it was so easy to just jump in, right? And, and get on the mm -hmm. call and, and not have to like install anything and things like that. So I was, I was really pushing for that as well. But um, but as we do more of these and we hear more from, from teachers and their experiences all across the, the world, um, we, we think about, yeah, how when we hear about the experiences with students. And we think about how can we uh, make adjustments to that. And the virtual rating room is, is one that, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Google engineers are working on it right now, but I wouldn't be as optimistic about on, on that rolling out, um, you know, sooner rather than later. That's, that's not a quick fix. So I, I'm not sure why it happened with us today. I think it's because when I created it, I created it with the, the idea domain. And if you're not mm -hmm. in that domain, it yeah. forced me to permit, admit, right. admit everybody to come in. Right. So, so, I think... I, so, it, so it may be possible, right? Because that, that feature is like built in, but mm -hmm. most likely with, with all of us here, we'd be working with students in our domain. Right, right? So exactly. There, there would not be that admit option, but you're absolutely right. And for those that didn't hear that or understand that, if someone, you know, you hear sometimes this little ding dong, I don't know if you, everyone hears that, but um, basically when someone outside of the idea Illinois tries to join this call, um, Lindsay and I, I heard it too, um, and see a little uh, pop up on the screen that says, so-and-so wants to join the call, do you admit or deny? So that, Technic technical functionality does exist, so maybe they can they can open that up. Right, exactly. So that's the only reason why it worked today, and it wouldn't necessarily work within your schools and districts. Correct. Um, can I have a student become the presenter and share their screens so we can do presentations? Ah, certainly. I think anyone right now could, if you hover over the bottom, uh, it, it says start presenting. So if I stop presenting, I don't know if we want to try this right now, but it says present now. And therefore, you can then go ahead and present your screen. Um, we don't have the ability to like take over a remote host, um, which is fine. But you can definitely uh, share the screen. We don't have the ability to do like breakout rooms. Oh, there's a mint. Um, but so everyone's in the same call. And then the other thing, 
the two things that are opened up now in, in Google Meet are one, the ability to record. So as Lindsay mentioned at the beginning of the call, this is being recorded. Now with that being in mind, we do have guidance from at least our attorneys in the high school, and, and I, it might've been ISB too, but we should not be recording uh, really sessions with, with students so that their names and, and faces appear. We should not be doing that. Um, uh, certainly we don't have permission, or if you do, you have to have express permission from, from parents. So really the record feature, I think, is just if you were just giving a, a, a lecture or assignment and you want to record it and you're hosting it, maybe with other teachers and you're doing it, like a collaboration with other teachers to then share it with students, that's fine. Um, uh, so yeah, and, and then I'd say uh, another option to do um, uh, broadcasting on, on, on Hangouts Meet is the ability to live stream the event. So if, again, I mentioned that at the very beginning when we're looking at guidance, um, instead of hosting the, the meet and having everyone jump on the call, you would just push it out as a live stream event and then students can watch uh, when they're able to. And, and again, um, without technical as much technical potential issues there. Um, one more thing, sorry, because I'm sure I opened up a can of worms with the legality stuff, but um, you know, I, you could argue, yeah, and there's things like Flipgrid, I, I totally see that. I, I think it's, it, there's, different degrees too, right? I mean, I'm sure many of us are using applications where we do have students recording videos and that. And, and certainly if you're in that walled garden area, you know, students are signed into the app and they're using your accounts and only they could see Jordan access it, you know, that is still uh, potentially okay. It's really when we get into things like I'm posting this out there, right? Or, and, and even inadvertently, you know, we've seen horror stories of teachers just posting their meeting room for Zoom or this link for this meeting uh, on, on the web or on their website that's public, and then people find it and then jump on it and sabotage it really. And then even worse, potentially again, uh, you know, thinking about our students' identities and, and privacy. And I'm not a huge, 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 like privacy, I mean, again, I, I obviously think it's important, but I recognize that there are, lots of different um, potential pitfalls and, and things that we don't normally think about because we're not used to this environment that all of a sudden everything's moving so quickly, it's very easy for us to potentially uh, fall into a little trap here. And, and, and again, just being mindful of that, again, especially with all the apps that are coming out now that our, our, our teachers have access to or potential access to. Definitely. With my own children, um, they do a daily Zoom meet with their teacher right now at nine o'clock. But the mm -hmm. teacher sends out that sign-in information with Seesaw so that it's not out there publicly for anybody to enter. Um, but also, you could do that with Google Classroom and in, you know, in a secured environment to make sure that your students are the only ones gaining access to that as best you can. Nothing is perfect. Um, but again, we're just doing what we can to make sure that we're supporting learners at this really crazy time. Um, sure. Amber just added the link to the chat for the official ISB doc. It is pretty lengthy, but oh, it is- many pages. Yeah, but I mean, I, I really, and Amber will tell you as well, I really think they did a great job yeah. on outlining some guidelines that are just some good best practices to stay focused on. Um, mm -hmm. So it's definitely worth, you know, a once over if you haven't already perused it. I think there's a shorter 17 page FAQ doc too, if you can find that, that's also good. Perfect. Um, so that were that was all the questions within the chat for now, David. Um, okay. Anybody else uh, or anything that comes up or anyone want to jump on the mic and, and, and ask a question or kind of uh, give a shout out? I'll do wait time. Let me think if I have. Forms that I see. Okay, so um, let me see if I share my screen. So let me go back to present now. Share screen. And again, let me know. I'll just do a quick little bit on forms, and then let me know if more questions come in. But share my screen again. And so you know, we talked about forms as a potential usage for online tests or assessments, uh, and really, again, anything from like surveys and, and feedback. Uh, form of assessments. I heard someone, I think I saw something say like a choose your own adventure type path as well. So again, if, if I wanted to create that forms, let's go to Google Forms. This is also in Drive, New, More, and then Forms, right? You create a new form and they have some templates here, which is kind of cool too. So you only see this when you go into that create new form uh, option instead of going through Drive. And um, you can do a blank uh, form, quiz, exit ticket, assessment, things like that. I'll just start from scratch. 
And we saw this already a little bit, just the different types of question types in a form. So including some that you may not have known before. So your basics are your short answer uh, and paragraph response. All that means is just get a longer amount of space to type in for your students. Obviously, multiple choice checkboxes and drop down are similar. The difference being multiple choice, you can only choose one checkboxes, all that apply. And then drop down only one, but it condenses all those options. So if you have like a 20 option you know, item list, you can uh, drop down is good to kind of keep that condensed. File upload, so you can actually upload uh, attachments uh, to a Google form. Scales, grids, and then date and time. But on top of that, I wanted to point out a couple of things uh, here. So one, uh, let's see, what is your favorite color? Okay. And let's say I made this a multiple choice question. Let's see if Google is even smart enough to say what color is. No, okay. It's getting scary when they, because they, they start adding the uh, answer choices uh, based on your question, because they're reading it. And then if I go to three dots here, uh, someone asked me about choose your own venture. So this is where you can have what's called logic branching for your Google Forms. So if I choose red, I can go to one section. So I'm going to say red fans. And then I'm going to have another section called blue fans. And I can say, if they chose red, go to this section. If they chose blue, go to this section. This is called logic branching. And it's based on this three dots, only on a multiple choice question or a drop down question, right? Because it has to be uh, a question type that can only choose one answer. There's only one path they can go on, but they choose which path. So I do that and then um, it'll take them to the proper section. And you can really branch this out even further. So thinking about this, taking a step back, you can you know, think about assessments where maybe they get the right answer, they go one way and they get the wrong answer another way. Maybe it's two different opinions on something. They go one way for one opinion and then they go another way for a different one. And I really recommend you know, working with students so that they understand this. They see this on the back end. So when we think about project-based learning, can students design uh, a survey or a form or a choose your own adventure? And then they get to decide the paths and, and, and map it out. And it's really to think about this, to create this, takes a lot of, I think, uh, skills and brain power that uh, you don't normally use, I guess, potentially, right? So to map this out. So thinking about that, um, that's logic branching. That's something that I, I feel uh, is a little underutilized. And another piece is that uh, many people may not know that you can add images and videos to your uh, Google Forms. So if I go ahead and add a image of, oh, I don't know. Oh, why did I say clowns? April Fool's Day. But um, I'll just go in my old standby. I'm missing sports. So we'll just go with that. All right. So Cubs logo. Sorry if we have. Sox fans on the call. It's Mike McGowan on the call. All right, so we got that. And here's a huge logo. Let's shrink that down. Um, so you can add images and then ask questions based on that. So this could be a map. And then you ask a question after this uh, map. So question, who's the best baseball team in the world? Okay, and we're leading them, of course. It's a leading question because you've got the image right there. But, um, and then you give your answer choices. So, all right, so there really is one correct answer there, right? So you can do that with an image and then your question. You can also do the same thing with a video, right? So Cubs World Series 2016, reminder. All right, there we go, got that. And then same thing, watch this video answer this question okay who won the 2016 series that yeah, right so uh, the way this looks then right in the, in the form always preview your form looking at it what's your favorite color that would take us to a different section but i didn't really flesh that out much but again here's the image there's no there's no text here so common misconception or you know hang up sometimes is you can just insert the image. You got to insert the question after. You can't put the two together, okay? But essentially, that's what we're doing, right? We have the question right after the image, and then same thing with the video right here, okay? So that's a couple of additional features in Google Forms you may not be using already that you can really potentially use further. Another thing really quick is this little icon. You may not have, have seen this before. I can add an image as my answer choice. So same thing. I want all things red. I want this to be a, a, a that, oh, red aesthetic, maybe. Okay, let's just do red. Okay, so I do that, insert that, so that that's going to be part of my answer choice. And then uh, blue, this works great on touch devices, right? So you have a more of a, an icon as opposed to a word uh, as your choice. So I do that, insert that guy here. And so when we look at the form, 
um, I'm, I see the prompts for the, the colors and then I can choose that based on what image is there. Okay, so super cool, I think, on that. A lot of people may not use that. Um, and then another favorite, mm, do I wanna go there? Sure, why not? Uh, Pre-filled link. So if you wanted to pre-fill responses, eh, would you use this? I don't know, I'll just do it anyways. So if you wanted to kind of help guide the, uh, the student along, maybe there's a, a type in question that you, um, you know, want them to kind of pre-fill, you can do that. And then you'll have that link to um, copy that link so that when they fill out the form next, they will have the answers already ready to go. So, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Look at, you know, when you're looking at your forms, look for more options under settings and then three dots and then play around with stuff. Or if anybody has any questions on anything about these right now, I can play around with that a little bit. So let me pause. Did I lose everyone? Uh oh, I put Lindsay to sleep. No, Sorry, not no. at all. I was oh. just looking, I was trying to find any other questions. I think you answered most of them. Okay, okay. Um, we talked a little bit in the chat about Google Sites. Um, yeah, and... okay. thanks, Mia. Definitely play around with that. I, I love that. And I think, again, it's hidden, right? It's that little icon. You don't, you don't really think about it. You'll see it only for that, I think, multiple choice on that one. I don't think that's available for drop down. Um, these sweet templates. So um, tell me a little bit more, Yvette. So are you thinking like templates where, um, well, tell me more, like a, a doc that you want all your students to kind of use, um, a template for like other teachers to use? Um, Cause I guess, yeah, hyperdoc. So I'm really thinking like for teachers, um, I'm trying, so I'm creating like a professional learning community for my teachers at school. Um, and so really right, we're all running by the seat of our pants to get resources in teachers' hands. And there's so many great resources out there. Mm -hmm. um, I know um, I'm a little more tech savvy than other folks. So I know you can literally Google templates. So I'm, every time I'm in these different um, amazing professional communities, like you guys are hosting here today, mm -hmm. but like saying like, what are some of your favorites? Cause beyond just Googling, like today someone was doing the choose your own adventure, right? So I just quickly Googled choose your own adventure template within Google Forms and it, multiple e links popped up where people can just make a copy of the one that's there and then yeah. edit the form because my brain might not work with how that for, right, how the development of that form, like I know how to do it, yeah. but showing it to teachers, having that template so they can manipulate and see where things go, um, building blocks, right? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think you're right on. I think, you know, I think we, we, we all know kind of that our staffs and our buildings are going to be different. So that's why I, I've never really been like, there's just, I, I'll go back to resource overload. There's like a ton of stuff out there, but ultimately I think, I think the best match is probably customizing and, and, and curating, I guess, lists into what really our staff needs at this moment. Right. So, you know, already, if someone's asking for a choose your own adventure template, you can find it, then making that accessible to your staff. And then whether you use like Google Classroom or just a hyperdoc someone mentioned, which is again, is just like a, a, a slideshow or a uh, Google doc that just has links to resources. Um, I'll share, you know, our page right now um, is basically just a website. So we, oh, just kidding. E-learning, not just learning. We're doing it E-style. All right, so this is our site. So again, we are very clear on what the expectations for our teachers are. We are keeping a running blog um, that we post like updates each day on what we're learning and, and some additional pieces. We um, created some classes, things like that. We talked about like, this is more at the beginning, like how do you actually, you know, take your course online. So we thought about what our teachers needed the most, you know, when things started getting a little bit dicey, a little bit, right? We said, hey, the rules of our student handbook still apply. We, we posted this and made sure this is front and center. Uh, we talk about Zoom a lot. We talk about, um, you know, Remind and Hangouts Meet and things like that. So what do our students, or I'm sorry, what do our teachers need the most and how do we uh, go ahead and share that out? We do have, so maybe this event, this might speak to you about uh, templates. We did have, we created this more for e-learning when we think about snow days, but this is a great uh, uh, resource. I'll put the link to our into the chat too, if you didn't catch it. Um, so this has some ideas. And then when you click on these, um, you get a link to just a quick tech guide that we wrote uh, about how to kind of get started with the tool and what you might do uh, as teachers. So um, this is all available for, for our staff and, and for you all. Um, 
and we have a discussion board and some other some pieces here. So I'll just make this available. I'll share this out uh, in the chat. So it's Bitly ETHS e learning going in the chat. One second. Okay. So cool. Yeah. That's really incredible, David. Did yeah. you yeah. did your district have like an e learning plan or did you kind of make this up as you were going? No, it's a good question. We we actually did. So we we made this plan. This plan's been in the works for a year and a half now, honestly. So okay. when we when we we were I think one of the first schools to really move forward with what the kind of the ISB guidelines. We weren't one of the three pilot schools, but but in terms of like the, the guidelines, like getting a board meeting set up and getting it putting the advance notice out there, we followed all the rules before you know this all happened. So um, we felt pretty good about at least the plan. Obviously everything gets changed and evolved uh, since then, but um, Yes, yeah, you can post that. That's a public site. Um, there are going to be some things that are going to be, you know, internal. So you might get some. You don't have permissions, but um, just be mindful of that. But everything else um, should be good to go. So thanks for asking them. Um, so yeah, so that we have that site, and again, that site is, you know, it, other schools have that. Uh, you know, I, I, I recommend taking that and, or taking some of the ideas from that site and making it for your own uh, district and school. It doesn't have to be that that. Take, took time and, and you know a team to put together. Don't worry if yours is just a single page document that has a bunch of resources for your staff. That is gonna be what's most helpful, especially when staff are seeing all this stuff out there. They, they really wanna know what, what do you think I need for right now for my school and for my students? That's great. It's great perspective to know that because I think when somebody sees how how well you've got that put together, it's important to hear that's been a year in the making. Yeah. And if we didn't start a year ago, ours is going to look different than Absolutely. that. But now they have this incredible resource to kind of share with their superintendents, yeah. their principals, their districts, so that you know it's not recreating the wheel when you see something that looks like it's working. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, for sure. So we're coming to the end of our time. Are there any other questions or concerns um, that we can utilize David for at this time? We've been sharing a lot of resources in the chat so that we can utilize these later. They will be archived and recorded and sent back to you um, so you don't have to keep up with all of it. But I think a lot of good information has been shared within this hour. For sure. Lindsay, can you just remind them that we'll be doing this each week? Yes. Yeah, so every every week at this same exact time, we will be talking all things Google with um, some experts that are in the field who are working just like you. Um, if you are happen to, to utilize Google and another tool or resource as well, like Microsoft or Apple, we are running those sessions as well. Um, yesterday, we had our Apple session in the afternoon, and tomorrow we'll have our Microsoft in the morning. And then we also have live office hours with coaches. So if you happen to be in a district that does not have an instructional coach, um, you can pop on any of the chats throughout the week um, to meet live with coaches throughout the state and kind of pick their brains, get your, your questions answered and figure out some best practices. Amber's added the um, calendar of all of these upcoming events um, that you can access. We are in talks now with uh, sharing some resources for special education students, specifically students with IEPs, um, because we know that that's an area of need as well. So, um, you know, keep an eye out for that. I'm going to share your link for your CPDUs or your PDHs right now. And you will get a PDH for um, any event that you attend live with us. So sign up for as many as you can get the recording, but if you attend live, you'll get a PDH for it. And then finally, big thank you to David. Um, I know that you're juggling a lot, not just professionally, but personally. You've got little ones at home too. So thank you for carving out some time to meet with us today and share your expertise. This has been awesome. No, my pleasure. It's been fun. Uh, I, I got a chance to go away from my email for a hot minute. <laughs> Have fun with that. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> but uh, no, this is super fun. I appreciate those great questions. Uh, a lot of them are, are, are ones that a lot of educators are asking right now. So definitely, thanks for, for joining us. Um, don't hesitate to ask and shoot emails to idea. I, I'd be happy to answer any questions or if you have any additional 
thoughts. Uh, we're all learning from each other. So if you have a great idea or if you have an idea, it, it, it'll be great. Uh, please share that out. And uh, yeah, thanks all for coming. Be safe, as someone said, too. Absolutely. Well, thank you, everybody. That's our, our time. And you can expect this um, recording tomorrow in your email. Have a good one and um, stay healthy, everybody.